Phyllis Dials of Bee City USA. We're here tonight with Brandon Basham sharing how to have our habitat supported for our native bees. Congratulations on 10 years of Bee City USA and over 300 affiliates. Tell us how this powerful work is reaching out to help pollinators everywhere. When people learn about how incredible the whole world of pollination ecology is, it's kind of mind-boggling. And so I, I got stung <laughs> over 10 years ago and just thought when everybody learned about what's happening to the bees and how we can help them, um, that maybe a lot of people would start helping. And so that little kernel of an idea has grown. And as you say, now we have 300 affiliates, both B campuses, which are universities, and B cities in 45 states. And now it's a program of the Xerces Society in Portland, Oregon, who is doing an incredible job. And so uh, people are catching on that we need the bees even more than they need us for our diets, for maintaining the biodiversity on the planet. All the living things we see here are somehow dependent on the bees. And so what the cities and the campuses are doing is just creating more awareness and even more importantly, habitat. Habitat where they can live, where they can nest, where they can reproduce, where they can overwinter, where they can find food free of pesticides, and um, it's really wonderful to watch people across the country doing that work. Well, I am so happy to see the support of Xerxes Society with Bee City USA now, and it is absolutely great to see what you're doing here tonight. Thank you so much well, for the great thank work. thank you. Thank you to Living Web Farms. Yes, and thank you for spreading this support to pollinators everywhere because we are the voice for nature in its own form. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Happy Pollination Celebration! Woo! I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker tonight. We're so excited. Brandon Brasham. He's a nature writer. You may have seen some of his writings. He's a horticulturalist and small business owner at Bruglies Beescaping. I think you coined that word, Beescaping. <laughs> I'd like to hope so. Um, which offers a variety of nature education and habitat restoration services. He writes weekly nature articles for the Silva Herald, and he's been featured in regional and national publications. Brandon's published works include a nonfiction collection of nature articles, a guide to the wonderful world around us, and his children's book, Finding Home, A Story of a Mason Bee. Brandon has presented nearly 40 times around the region in the past four years, and recently published an online course series, Gardening for the Planet, which teaches students methods to become stewards of the environment in their own backyards. In addition to nature education, Brandon offers habitat restoration and pollinator landscape design services. Give it up for Brandon. Well, thank you, Phyllis, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I am Brandon Basham, as has been introduced. And today, we're going to learn a little bit about how to save some of the native bees here in North America. And now, the first thing to kind of learn when you're trying to save a creature is learning about its unique life cycles, maybe what it eats, where it lives, and again, how you can kind of engender their populations through your own gardening. So today we're going to take kind of a nitty gritty dive into some of the 4,000 species of native bees here in North America alone. We're going to learn about how they live their lives, where they make their nests, and maybe more importantly, where they find shelter throughout multiple seasons of the year. Now, interestingly enough, one of the best and easiest things you can do to foster native bee populations is actually leave wild areas alone. Let them kind of grow on their own, culture a diverse collection of plants native to the area, but leaving an area alone doesn't necessarily mean ignoring it. Probably one of the most important things to do if you do have natural areas kind of in and around your spaces is make sure those native spaces aren't being overrun by invasive species like bittersweet, kudzu, privet, I could go on and on. And so 
first thing to do in your native spaces is take a walk around and take a close look at your plants. See if they're all kind of growing in kind of a stalemate, in kind of a semi-friendly environment, or if there are some plants that are taking over your spaces that might need some further research and removal down the line. Now, beyond that, a vast majority of our bees live in either bare soil or in dead wood, either dead standing trees or dead wood that's fallen, either a branch or a wood that's fallen. And so another very important thing you can do, especially for our native bees, is leave areas of soil that are either bare or have sparse layers of mulch on them. So you can give those native species access to the soil where they make their nests. About 70% of our 4,000 bees here in the States live in the ground. The other 30% actually live in dead standing trees that are normally in a natural environment bored into by beetle larvae or other boring insects. And so not only do a lot of our bees rely on dead wood in an area, but they need dead wood that's been lived in by very specific species of animals that can actually bore their holes for them. There is, of course, one species here in the States that excavate wood on its own. Those are the carpenter bees. Everyone knows and loves. We'll get into those in a bit, and I can really kind of convince you of their benefits and really kind of their, their docile, uh, curious nature. Now, interestingly enough, most of the animals that you see in and around your garden are in the insect order Hymenoptera. This is a very ancient order of insects, and they're all tied together by their wings. All of these animals have membranous wings, and they actually have two sets of wings, or four wings total, that hook together in flight. So that kind of links all these animals together, and they do have a common ancestry as well. Interestingly enough, the sawflies up in the top right are thought to be the most ancient members of this order. And you can kind of think of sawflies as wasps that raise their young in plants that are still alive. And so they use those plants as kind of a protective nest that not only feeds their young, but also protects them as they grow. Evolving from those kind of plant-using sawflies, which actually their name comes from their saw-like ovipositors, which they use to saw into wood, the next kind of animal to evolve from them evolutionarily were actually wasps in the bottom left. And basically wasps were sawflies who decided that the plants they were feeding on weren't nearly enough of a challenge. They decided to get out and hunt some active prey. And so the one thing that sets these two apart are wasps, of course, feed their young protein in the form of prey remains. Usually that's chewed up insects or the protein that they find out in the field. Now, also interestingly enough, the other two animals on this slide, both ants and bees, both evolved from wasps probably about 200 or so million years ago. Ants are thought to be basically wingless wasps, and a great example of a wingless wasp that's still around today is actually the fig wasp. And so we're all familiar, of course, with the fig fruit, but as a fig grows, actually before it becomes a fruit, it's kind of like a, a flower that's folded in on itself. So if you think of the inside of a sunflower that's actually made up of hundreds of tiny little flowers, a fig is very similar, except its flower is folded in on itself. It looks like a tiny little fig. And there's only one way to get in. There's a one-way entrance. It's a tiny little hole that only fig wasps can enter. And actually, as a female fig wasp, what she does is she flies around looking for a specific fig, and she crams her way up that little hole in the bottom of the flower. It's usually such a tight fit that that female usually ends up losing her wings and some of her legs kind of in the scramble to get in the fig. She lays her eggs inside of the fig, and her young hatch, uh, mature, and then actually the males have only one job. Once the male hatches, they actually have very small vestigial eyes, and they have huge jaws. Their one job is just to kind of excavate a way out. And so they dig a hole kind of in the fig, the females leave, the males actually die inside the fig, and the fig kind of reincorporates it into itself, so you kind of are eating wasps when you're eating figs, but they've been reincorporated back in the plant. It's kind of extra protein, if you will. But again, that's a great example of probably one of the ways that early ants evolved from early wasps. They find, probably found, you know, little nooks and crannies that they found wings either, you know, uh, kind of unwieldy or just distasteful. And about 150 million years ago, probably a little bit sooner, maybe 120 million years ago, a group of wasps 
kind of similar to how wasps evolved from saw flies. A group of wasps kind of looked around and they said, oh my gosh, what am I doing? This isn't the way I want to live. They decided, you know, hunting wasn't their style, so a group of wasps decided to kind of go the hippie route. They grew their hair out, they decided to just visit plants for their food. And so the major difference between bees and wasps is actually what they feed their young. Both of these animals rely on nectar as a food source as adults, but as young, wasps rely on protein from prey insects, and bees rely on protein from flowers. And that's, of course, why bees have developed their profuse hairs that help them in a variety of ways to both find and gather pollen on themselves. Now, the vast majority of these animals, not only here in the States, but worldwide, are what's known as solitary. That means these animals live alone, they don't share labor, they don't cooperate in a large hive like some other social animals, and because of that, they're much less aggressive or ornery um, because they haven't developed any defensive instincts around defending a large hive. And so the first thing to keep in mind as you're observing really all of our bees and wasps is they'd much rather run than put up a fight because the vast majority of them are the only ones doing all the work. And so they're very flighty, very docile, very fun and easy to watch without having to worry about being harmed yourself. Now, the only exception is, of course, the ants. The ants are really the only animal or the only insect that's only purely social in the hymenoptera. They're really kind of the true social butterflies in the insect world. So we don't know right now of any ants that are solitary. But again, the vast majority of the other animals in this order live that solitary, kind of lonely life cycle. And now, you might be surprised to find that these are some of the most common bees that you'll see in and around your yard. And one quick glance at this slide should give you just an example of how closely linked bees and wasps are evolutionarily. And as I explained before, the major difference is those profuse hairs all over bees. And now, interestingly enough, bees use their hairs in a variety of ways to help find and gather pollen. Now, first off, most petals kind of look smooth to our eyes, even some kind of jagged leaf varieties. But if you were to look at a leaf under a microscope, most petals are covered in tiny microscopic structures. Those little structures serve to actually give the flower a negative electrical charge as wind flows over those structures on the petal. Now, the other side of the coin, as bees kind of fly and jostle around throughout the air, their thousands of hairs are constantly rubbing up against each other. And that rubbing motion serves to give the bee a positive electrical charge. And as we all know from Science 101, a negative charge attracts a positive charge. So when a positively charged bee lands on a negatively charged flower, all that negatively charged pollen is just sucked right onto the bee. Even farther than that, of course, I'm sure we've all done this, but if you've ever rubbed a balloon on your head and then pulled it away and watched how your hairs kind of follow the balloon, Bees actually are able to follow their hairs in a very similar way. So bee hairs actually point in the direction of the nearest electromagnetic field, which is usually, again, a small flower. And so especially in foliage-dense areas, bees actually rely on their hairs to point the direction to the nearest blossom. And also fascinatingly, bees are able to read those electromagnetic fields on flowers, and they're able to tell if there was a recent visitor. And so bees, again, are constantly using their hairs to kind of find and collect pollen, both at the same time. 